Let's turn now to exploring the Shema, discussions on the issues of Trinity, and um, let's take a look at the uh, verses we've got lined up for us tonight. Uh, let me get those right pages pulled up. There we go. And um, we're going to start by looking, let me drop all the way down to the bottom of this chart uh, in my study that uh, Karm has uh, put together for us. As you can see on my screen right now, we've been working our way through the Bible passages that bring together the truths of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as one God who nevertheless interacts with man through the person of the Father, the person of the Son, and the person of the Holy Spirit. Three separate persons, not one God simply swapping out masks whenever he chooses. That's modalism. We reject that. And certainly not three separate gods who have these interactions with, with mankind. We would call that, um, well, we'd call it idolatry to be sure, but um, uh, tritheism, tritheism, not three separate gods. That's not what Trinity is. It's one God with three persons. As difficult as it is to embrace that truth. And the way we interact with that is we look at passages in the Bible. And that's what we're doing. We find words and terms and attributes and characteristics of this one God, but we find these words and terms applied across the three persons in such a way that causes us to realize that when it comes to discussions on identity, if we could talk kind of um, uh, either either um, kind of ontologically or epistemologically, then when, we when we're talking about terms of identity, we, it becomes apparent that the Bible's describing one God, and yet at times a different person is in view. And we're going to look at that tonight. We're going to talk about how that God the Father is our Savior, and yet at the same time, Yeshua, God the Son, is is our savior as well and that's what we're going to look at and it's going to be a it's going to be a detailed study now i've got lots of verses to pull up so let's just just strap yourselves in and we'll jump right into it first of all karm only has if you look at your chart karm only has verses outlined for god the father and god the son you're looking at four columns in front of you the first column uh let me just go to the very top so you can see what these mean the first column is the um the heading or the characteristic or the title or the attribute that were that's in view and then the second column is um the 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 uh uh, the application to the Father, God the Father. The, th the uh, third column is the application to the Son. And the fourth column, the, fi the final one, the far right, is the application of these uh, attributes to the Holy Spirit. So let's, with that in mind, we can better understand this table. God the Father is our Savior in 1 Timothy and in, um, in fact, all throughout 1 Timothy. We're just going to park out there. And in for uh, God the Son, we've got 2 Timothy and we've got Titus. And then you'll notice that God the Holy Spirit doesn't show up as our Savior because that's not really the way the Bible portrays him as our Savior. Although, although we're going to find out that our salvation, when we're talking about personal salvation, is intimately and directly linked to the Holy Spirit, as we'll see, and thus his work is necessary to bring about and to actualize genuine salvation. So I've decided to fill in some verses on my own. Although he's not portrayed as the one who... Um, uh, 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 in enacts salvation. He's not the agent of salvation. He's, it wasn't the Holy Spirit that hung on the cross and things like that. You guys understand what I'm trying to say there. All right, so let's jump right into the verses. I've decided that instead of jumping into 1 Timothy and instead of jumping right into the New Testament like most of us are fond of doing, I decided to do like I did last week. And let's jump into the um, what I call the antecedent theology. That is the, the theology that preceded our, the theology that's in question. So oftentimes we, we look at the New Testament for salvation, but in reality, the Old Testament came before, and the theology of the Old Testament, what it's trying to teach us, forms the background and the foundation for a better understanding of what the New Testament is really teaching us anyway. That's what I mean by antecedent theology. Antecedent refers to something that came before something else. So, or the preceding theology, antecedent theology, preceding means the same thing. So, I want to jump back into the Tanakh first, and let's look at God as the Savior of Israel. That's going to form the framework for understanding God as our Savior in the New Testament, and ultimately understanding Jesus as our Savior as well. What does God say of Isaiah, uh, God does say through Isaiah, of Israel, starting in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 3? This shows up all over the place, but I'm just going to focus on one verse for, for brevity's sake, okay? So, um, let's start in this passage right here. God says to Israel, For I am the Lord your God, God, 
the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you. So God is the Savior of Israel. Now, I understand it's a political sense of the word. The word Savior, as we see in the Hebrew over on the right side of the screen, Ki ani Adonai Elohecha, Kadosh Yisrael Moshi Echa. I, the Lord, am your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. The final word in my Hebrew there, right there, Moshi Echa, is actually where we get the word Mashiach as well, Messiah in English. I am your Moshiach, right? Moshiacha. I'm the Moshiach of you. I'm your Savior. It's where we get Yeshua's name. Yeshua and Mashiach are all rooted in the same uh, same uh, uh, family of words in the Hebrew. Uh, Messiah in English. So, I, the Lord, am your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Messiah, right? But the word Savior or salvation or Mashiach or Moshiach, uh, whatever the root is, Yasha, to save and things like that, in the Hebrew as well as in the, the Greek, um, these words can have a range of meanings. So let's just take a look at some of what um, the prophets are trying to get at.